Namaste. So, in keeping with the theme of Brahma Sutras, the rest of the first chapter basically is an extended, elaborate refutation of atheistic Sankhya. Now, as we pointed out previously, atheistic Sankhya is, for all practical purposes, identical to modern materialism, in that it says that the cause of everything is material, that there is no God, there is no controller, there is no spiritual world, there is none of that. Everything is simply material, and all the phenomena that we see in this world arise from atoms, basically. The interaction of atomic nature. So, of course, Shankaracharya takes issue with that and defeats it, trounces it completely. <laughs> and actually before him, Vyasadev also crafted many of the sutras in opposition to this philosophy. Now, Sankhya philosophy is also praised in Bhagavad Gita. And it's said that one who masters this philosophy is able to discriminate spirit from matter. So that seems contradictory. How is it so? Well, originally, Sankhya was given by Kapila Deva. Kapila was an incarnation of Vishnu who appeared in ancient times, Puranic times, and taught this philosophy as a way to discriminate spirit from matter. And by this process of discrimination, neti neti, huh? gradually one can eliminate all the different forms of matter and by process of elimination, return to the original spiritual cause of everything, the purusha. Purusha means the person, and it also means the controller. And in the Upanishads, it's an appellation of Brahman. But in later times, the word Purusha became identified only with a person, a personality, and actually a mundane personality, an individual soul. You know, this is the way of the material world, that everything, no matter how elevated in the beginning, gradually becomes degraded and into its own opposite. So this certainly happened to Sankhya. At the time that Bhagavad Gita was spoken, Sankhya was still a theistic philosophy, pointing at God as a person. In other words, the secondary Brahman, or conditioned Brahman. But then in later times, it became degraded into an irrational, atheistic philosophy of material change alone. So by the time Shankaracharya appeared, it was actually in opposition to Brahma Sutras. They didn't believe in Brahman. They didn't believe in God as a person. They only believed in the individual soul as the cause of everything. So this is why in the Brahma Sutra, there are so many sutras and so much of Shankara's commentary to defeat it. Now, this is very good for us today because today in the world we live in, the materialistic philosophy has become supreme. It has taken over everything. And it has become the default explanation for all phenomena, including the world, the universe, it's everything. In order to counteract this, in order to rise above it, 
in order to develop the discrimination that we need to actually perceive the self as spirit, we need powerful arguments against this atheism. Shankaracharya also points out in his commentary on Bhagavad Gita that even the atheistic version of Sankhya is very useful for developing discrimination. And so he elaborately describes the whole system and as his commentary evolves toward the end, he gives a complete summation of this system so that we can understand it as it rightly is. So what is Sankhya? Let's take a look at it and explain in detail. Sankhya is the analysis of the material creation into 25 tattvas, or ontological categories, meaning that everything that exists, everything that we perceive, everything that we experience in the world belongs to one or more of these 25 categories. What are they? Let's go through it in detail. First of all, the Sankhya Darshan is one of the six Darshans, or supplementary Vedic philosophies, that analyze and describe the contents of the four Vedas so that ordinary people can understand them. There are 25 tattvas. A tattva means a principle, or in our case, an ontological category. These are the things that can be, that can exist in the world. First of all, we have the karanam, the causes. And the first is Purusha, the Lord and controller of the universe. Second is Prakriti, or material nature, matter, and all its features. This leads to the development of ahankara, false ego, or identification with matter. Buddhi, intelligence, which is the plan-making and discriminatory faculty of manas, the mind. Mind includes memory, perception, and all kinds of mundane logic and various other mental phenomena. These are the causes. And what do they cause? The tanmatras, the sense objects. Now, the tanmatras, the artha, the elements or states of matter, and the jnanendriyas, the knowledge-acquiring senses, correlate in threefold correlation. For example, sound. The subtle sense object of sound is a property of akasha, space or emptiness, and they are the object of the jnanendriya, the ears. Similarly, light sense object of light, is agni, fire, or plasma, that is, ionized gas. And this gives form, which is seen with the eyes. The tanmatra of pressure is the quality of vayu, air, which is a non-ionized gas. And this is the sense of touch. Flavor is a property of jala, water, or the liquid phase of matter, which gives rise to taste. And finally, fragrance is a quality of prithivi, the earth or solid matter, which is the object of the sense of smell. And finally, we have the karmendriyas, the active senses, the mouth for speaking, the hands for touching and moving things, the legs for transportation, the genital for procreation, and the anus for elimination of waste. These are the 25 tattvas. So, if one learns to recognize these 25 tattvas, this is the material or the ground for the process of neti neti, uh, the process of meditation in the state of sushupti consciousness, samadhi, whereat when these things arise, one simply rejects them, nullifies them, that this is not real, this is not a reality, 
This is not something I need to be concerned with. If I want to realize myself, I have to get rid of these. I have to understand that these are but phenomena temporarily arisen in illusion and not the original cause or effect, but simply a temporary manifestation. So this is not the self. That is not the self. Water is not the self. Earth is not the self. Fire, air, even space is not the self. Although the Upanishads do contain beginning forms of meditation, where Brahman is meditated upon as air, as fire, as water, and so on. How is that? This is called adhyasa, superimposition. And then later on, with the development of intelligence and discrimination, one can remove the superimposed object and develop awareness of Brahman beneath it. Brahman is always the substrate of every phenomenon. So we can understand that in order to realize Brahman, we have to start someplace. We can't just arbitrarily and immediately cut off all material phenomena. That's not possible. Although the Neo-Advaitans would have us believe that it is so, practically speaking, it's impossible. There has to be a gradient, stepwise, gradual ascension to the topmost platform of Brahman consciousness. And this is attained by gradually deleting or merging these gross sense objects into the subtle sense objects, the subtle sense objects into the senses, and the senses into consciousness, and consciousness into Brahman at the end. This is the process of neti neti in detail. So, this is taught in the Upanishads. It's taught even in the Puranas, in Bhagavad Gita, in Mahabharata, and so on. Shiva Purana, so many places. And the Tantras, Lakshmi Tantra, and so on. This is so important. That's why it's considered one of the six darshans. Darshan means seeing God. So, one of the ways that we can see God is in the phenomena of the material world, and then gradually eliminating the phenomena, which are effects, and coming to the cause, and then gradually seeing the subtle cause, the subtler cause, until we reach the most subtle cause, which of course is Brahman. So, for example, in the Puranas, and also in the Upanishads, when the destruction of the material universe is described, how does it begin? With torrential rains. The rain, the water, dissolves the earth. And then they all merge water and earth into the cosmic wind. And then that in turn becomes fire the great fire that burns up everything. This is the Shiva Tandava, the dance of Shiva that destroys everything at the end of the material manifestation. So, in other words, the creation begins from the Purusha, God, creating the Prakriti, material nature, sometimes called the Pradhan, or the sum total of all the material elements. And this creates the Hiranyagarbha, the cosmic egg identified with Lord Brahma. And from that comes all the different forms, the subtle and gross elements, the different phenomena, and of course, the material living entities who populate the universe. And so this same process in reverse is exactly how the universe is destroyed at the end. 
and it is also how we can realize the actual nature of everything and attain to realization of Brahman. Aum Tat Sat. Aum Shakti Aum. Aum Namah Shivaya. <laughs>